Good morning, everyone. Our first thing I would like to do is like to like to thank Bob and Janie Miller for coming out last night. They did the movie The Girl Who Wore Freedom. It was an excellent documentary, and everyone should see it. Um, it really opened your eyes to what our veterans do, do for us and the freedoms we have today. So if you get a chance, um, go on Amazon and that and watch it. It's very, very moving and we should be thankful for what we have and our freedoms today. Um, Tyler Schleck had his seventh surgery, I believe. We're doing a car shower for him. His address is in the back of the church, or Janie has it. And don't forget next Saturday to turn your clocks back because you may be the first ones at church. We gain an hour. Bible study is going to resume this week. And at 10 a.m. and 6.45, there's going to be no Saturday night services until December 6th. Uh, let me see what else. November 27th at 6 p.m., Amy has a crew coming out, and everyone is welcome. We're going to decorate the church for Christmas. And November 15th at 6 p.m., we will have an outreach meeting in the Sexton's house. November 8th is a board meeting, and uh, Sam is in charge of it since he's the vice president. I will not be here the next two weeks because with my 50th class, I'll be on sailing on the ocean with Ruthie. So please pray for us Wednesday, Wednesday as we leave that we have a safe journey. And now, Carissa. Oh, no. Oh, Dwayne. Good morning. Good morning. So today is the last reminder about the famous pork and sauerkraut dinner on Saturday. Um, I'm not sure if I'm hoping for weather like we had yesterday, because that was almost too nice. But a nice, cool fall day gets everybody in the mood for pork and sauerkraut. So the pork's ordered. The potatoes are ordered. We're ready to go. All we need is you. We need help. So the sign-up sheet is out at the North X. We especially need some help for servers for like the five to seven o'clock shift. Serving is just standing at the buffet line and dishing out the, the potatoes and the pork and the sauerkraut as people come through. We also need some kitchen help too. So if you like behind the scenes kind of stuff, uh, sign up please and help us out. If you're tuning in online, what I'll try to do is snap a picture of that sign-up sheet and show you where those uh, holes remain. And if you can help us out, we would greatly appreciate it. If you can't, and if you just want to come and eat, please bring your neighbors, bring your friends. Like Nancy said, you've got an extra hour of sleep, so if you eat a little too much <laughs> and you need a little extra time to recuperate, you've got an extra hour. So again, we hope to see everybody out here next Saturday. Thanks. Good morning. Abigail would love to thank everybody in this church for their generous support for her and Abigail's adventure and the Down Syndrome Center of Trexler Town. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, a reminder today is the All You Can Eat Drama Club breakfast at the West Penn Fire Company. It's $10 for All You Can Eat pancakes sausage and bacon, so it goes till 12 o'clock. Please go out and support the children. Uh, the other thing, Operation Christmas Child, we have two more weeks. The boxes are going to be due November 12th. Uh, if you happen to be away, Nancy just caught me because she's going to be away. I do not take them until Tuesday night. So if you need to, you can always drop them off at my house or um, make arrangements with me. We do have a small video, as we do each week, and if you find that you have any questions, I don't want to kind of give you the same speech each week, but if you find that you have any questions, please feel free to seek me out after church, or my phone number is on the posters. For those watching at home, it's 570-778-4561. Um, Thank you, guys, and we're going to have a small video. <laughs> Thank you. 
When I was about one years old, my father was killed. After his passing, my mom just really could not deal with the pain of losing her husband. I kind of had to step up and be the head of the household at a very young age, five or six years old, taking care of my sister, looking after my grandparents, going from cottage to cottage and begging for food because I was too young to work at that time. I was mostly concerned with my sister Tanya though. She was my main priority. Not having very much, we still had each other. So while I was taking care of Tanya, you know, my mom was coming in and out of the household. And when one day she showed up and she was pregnant with my youngest sister, Ilona. My mother, in her drunk state, fed Ilona alcohol instead of milk. When Ilona passed away, I decided that Tanya and I would run away in search of a new life. We got on the bus and we left. We eventually got hungry. And so we started collecting empty bottles to trade those in for money and then use that money to buy food. And so as we were doing that, the clerk called the police. So that's when the police came by, picked us up, and first took us to the police station to question us. They decided to take us to a detention center. My mom was notified where we were. They asked her, they said, do you want your children? And she said, no, I don't want them. When my mother's rights were taken away, Tanya's biological father was notified. Sorry. I remember Tanya's father telling me, I'm taking Tanya home with me, but I don't want you because you're not my daughter. All I could feel was heartbreak, but I knew that I had to let her go. After losing Tanya, I didn't think about the future. It didn't matter anymore. I just remember on that day feeling very abandoned. No one cared about me. After about a year at the detention center, I was transferred to an orphanage. Because I felt so empty, I started praying on my own. Without even knowing God, I was crying out to him, asking him to give me a sign that everything was going to be okay. There is a purpose for me. Every night I would pray. And that is when Operation Christmas Child came to our orphanage. And I'm crying again, I'm so sorry. You're doing, you're doing awesome. This is a day that I received my Operation Christmas Child shoebox. Once I opened it, there were so many different things in there. But I remember my favorite item was a yellow yo-yo. To me, that yo-yo represented hope. It was an answer to my prayer. In that moment, I knew that this was the sign that God was sending me, that you are not alone. You are not an orphan, you are my daughter. And that's what I knew, that God is real, and that he is with me. The orphanage sponsored a choir trip to United States for two weeks. Because I was on that choir, I had the opportunity to travel to United States. And during the second week, I was hosted by a family in Virginia. We were at an event in the morning, and uh, we went to go out to lunch, and Elizabeth had fallen asleep in the back of the van, and I looked back at Elizabeth, and I heard, this is your daughter. That was supernatural for me. I, it was just, you know, I, I knew that the spirit had spoken to me at that point, so I was fortunate enough to take a photo of that. <laughs> I, in fact, still carry that with me today when I knew she was my daughter. They sat me down and they asked me if I wanted to be adopted. And I said, yeah, duh, <laughs> of course. They all flew out to Ukraine together to bring me home as a family. And this was the moment right before the plane touched on U.S. soil. And that was the moment that I officially became a U.S. citizen. It was a special moment. After my adoption, I had told my parents about this amazing gift that I had received at the orphanage and how much hope it brought me and what it meant to me. And we decided to pack as a family. My mom said, why don't we pack two shoe boxes or maybe three? And I said, no, we're gonna pack a hundred. Over the years as a family, we have packed over 8,000 shoe boxes. 
Operation Christmas Child is a part of my life. So anywhere I go, I always bring it with me. Starting as a family packing shoe boxes, going to college and getting people involved there, going to grad school and having my friends at grad school get involved and professors get involved, people at my gym. Anywhere I go, I'm always gonna take it with me. It was the first seed that was planted in my heart. The shoe box was a seed. Good morning. Good morning. On behalf of Zionstone Church, I welcome each and every one of you that are here today and also those that are watching us on the internet. Uh, for those who may not know, my name is Daryl Fritz. I'm a member here at the church. And Pastor Russ had asked me to, do, to lead the service this morning. And who can say no to Pastor Russ? And his sales pitch was, you know, they'd rather hear from somebody from the congregation than a supply minister. So you can take that for what it's worth. <laughs> but uh, this is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it. And let us start. Please rise and uh, join me in the invocation. Blessed be God, the one who forms us. Jesus, who bears the cross, the Spirit, who makes our joy complete. Amen. Amen. And a call to worship. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Through the earth give way, and the mountains fall in the heart of the sea. Through its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams may glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She, shall not, she will not fail. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in an uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord and desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among all nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let us bow before God in humility, confessing our sins. Steadfast and faithful God, you have revealed the ways of justice, yet we fail to follow you. We are overwhelmed by the world's violence and suffering. We are afraid to risk what we have for the sake of others. For the harm we have caused, known and unknown, forgive us. For the unjust demands we place on others and your creation, forgive us. For the ways we turn away from you and our neighbor, forgive us. Lead us back to you and set us on the right path. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Beloved in Christ, God's justice stretches beyond all understanding. God's compassion is beyond compare. In Jesus, God is always making a new way for us. In Christ, you are already and always forgiven. Amen. Now please join me in the next in the hymn The Mighty Fortress is Our God.
The first lesson is Jeremiah chapters 31, verses 31 to 34. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant. Though I was husband to them, declares the Lord, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law on their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Here ends the first lesson. The second lesson is from the first book of Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. You know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippia. As you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. You know, we never use flattery, nor do we put a mask on to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from men, not from you or anyone else. As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that you were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. Here ends the second lesson.
the Holy Gospel is taken from Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 46. The greatest commandment. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Then he asked, whose son is Christ? While the Pharisees were gathering together, Jesus asked him, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Here ends the reading. Please be seated. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Why me? You want me to do what? You must be kidding. These are some of the questions I thought of when I was preparing this sermon today, and it deals with the Old and New Covenant. And I would first like to start off talking about Moses. Now, most of us know the story of Moses and the burning bush. And that's when God called out, Moses, Moses, I am sending you to the Pharaoh to bring my people out of Egypt. Moses replied, who am I that I should go to the Pharaoh? I am slow of speech. Oh, Lord, please send someone else. Put yourself in Moses' place. You're 80 years old. For the last 40 years, you were herding sheep and goats. And now, God asks you to go confront the most powerful man in the world. Tell him, and tell him that he should give up voluntarily and without any compensation the source of all his power his slaves. And then, if you remember, Moses grew up in the royal palace, so he knew Egypt, and he knew about how many people he would have to lead. And the scripture tells us that there were 600,000 men, and that scholars believe it could have been up to 2.4 million people. Wow. Talk about a request. Can you imagine? First, you have to confront the most powerful man in the world. Then you have to lead 2.4 million people. How do you lead, organize, much less feed 2.4 million people? And you're traveling into a desert, no less. We know from the story that God provided the resources and the help necessary to do that task. And God was fulfilling his covenant he made with Abraham, that he would make his descendants into a great nation. And at this point, I want to make sure everybody understands what the word covenant meant back in biblical times. 
Covenant was a binding agreement sealed in blood. They took it very seriously. Okay? And now God was saying to his to the Israelites, I will bless and care for you. In return, I will give Moses the Ten Commandments on stone tablets. He also instructed Moses in various other laws. Moses took those laws and went to the Israelites. They agreed to obey and worship only him. And they used blood from animal sacrifices to seal the old covenant. Now, when they sealed the old covenant, God already knew that they would break that covenant. How do we know that? Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 16, when Moses was, was, couldn't go into the promised land, God had taken him, shown him where it would be, and he was telling him that he would die. And God said this, you are going to your fathers to rest with them. And these people will soon prostitute themselves to the foreign gods of the land they are entering. They will, they will forsake me and break the covenant I made with them. So he already knew the people would break that covenant. Fast forward 800 years when Jeremiah was a young man. By this time, Israel had divided into a northern and a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom had already fallen. fallen. In Judah, the southern, southern kingdom, society was deteriorating economically, politically, and spiritually. God's words were deemed offensive by the leaders. The people were selfish. They worshiped many different idols. God wanted his people to repent and remember the covenant he made with their forefathers. To do this, God chose Jeremiah, and he talked to him. And listen to the words he used when he called them. He said, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nation. And Jeremiah responded, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. Now, Jeremiah, though young, he was probably in his late teens, early 20s by this time. He had visited the temple often because his dad was a, was a priest. And he probably heard the men talking about the disregard that the leaders and people had for God's word. He probably saw or at least heard how they mistreated the prophets and they even murdered them. I can only imagine that what was going through Jeremiah's mind. It might have been, why me? You want me to do what? You must be kidding. But God knew that Jeremiah was reluctant. And he responded by reaching out his hand and touching Jeremiah's lips. And he said, now I have put my words in your mouth. He further tells Jeremiah, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in this land. Now Jeremiah knew that no matter what he did, his efforts would not prevent it his country from being destroyed. But for the next 40 years, he was God's faithful spokesman. While he experienced some short-lived positive response in the beginning, people returned to their sinful ways. His messages were ignored and sometimes met by hostile crowds. He was rejected by kings even by his family and friends. He stood alone. He was thrown in prison at times. He had to tell everyone in Judah that 
their country would be destroyed. They will be killed or taken captive. Even his beloved temple would be destroyed. And to bear all this, God told them not to marry, not to go to wedding feasts, not to go to funerals. His life was pretty sad. And that's why he's known as the weeping prophet. Now, questions entered my mind. Why did God wait 800 years to punish his people for breaking the covenant? Why did God enter a covenant he knew would be broken? I don't know the answers. But here, I think God realized the burden he had placed upon Jeremiah and the toll it took on Jeremiah. And I think he gave him the message of hope that we heard today read in our scripture. You know, the Lord declares, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant with my people. And he said, this is the covenant. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. But what does God mean when he told Jeremiah that he would put his law upon our minds and write it upon our hearts? How would he forgive our sins and remember them no more? 600 years later, we know the answers to these questions. Because Jesus was born. He conducted his ministry. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified. He died. And then he was resurrected. And at his ascension, he said this to apostles. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. In the book of Acts, we hear the rest of what Jesus told his apostles. He said, John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and entered in not only the apostles, but as the prophet Joel stated, I will pour out my spirit on all people. The spirit comforts us. It guides us to know his truth. It reminds us of Jesus' words. It gives us the right words to say, and it fills us with power. The Holy Spirit is now available to all who believe in Jesus and his resurrection. Why did God wait 600 years to implement the new covenant? Again, I don't know the answer. To some, this may be the end of the story of the, new, of the covenants. But I would like to direct your attention another 1,500 years in the future. The Christian church has grown. It has spread all across Europe and England. Everyone was a Christian. The Old Testament writings and the accounts of Jesus and his apostles were gathered together and bound in a book we now call the Bible. You would think everything is going well. You would think the gospel is being preached. You would think people are being saved. But all is not well. Christians of that day didn't even know the basics of the faith. They didn't know the Ten Commandments. They didn't know the Lord's Prayer. And in fact, some of the priests didn't even know the Ten Commandments or the Lord's Prayer. Church positions were being sold and bought with little regard to the knowledge of the scriptures. Bibles were only in the hands of scholars and of rich noblemen. They were written in Latin. 
church services were completely conducted in Latin. The common man had no knowledge of what was being said. He couldn't read it for himself. They were entirely dependent on what they were being told by other people or by what they observed in their traditions. However, these traditions were shaped by the dark ages that they came out of. The Christian of that time feared God. He viewed him as angry and vengeful, ready to punish. The Christian outlook was largely pessimistic. Their lives were filled with greed, violence, war, hunger, pain, disease, suffering, and then death. People were superstitious, believing in evil spirits that were controlled by witches. For many, the people of the saints, for many people, the saints became special deities and Christianity, a religion of many gods. They believed only church officials, priests or monks could go directly to heaven. Everyone else had to go to purgatory, a place where a person atones for his sins. A system of penalties was established by the church in addition to the judgment of God. At first, a pilgrimage or some humble service was prescribed. Then the practice of substituting money payments called indulgences became the norm. The powers to be realized they could raise more money for the church if they sold these indulgences to shorten a person's time in purgatory. And then they even sold indulgences so that you could shorten a relative's time in purgatory. And of course, purgatory was perceived and related to be a time of torture and suffering. And the more fearful the people were of this time in purgatory, the more indulgences they sold. I found one reference where an indulgence was bought to shorten someone's time by almost two million years. Martin Luther grew up in this culture and accepted it. His father was a miner who was successful. He even became owner of a mine or two. And he could afford an education for his son. Martin Luther attended a Latin school and then a university. His father wanted him to be a lawyer. But God had other plans. When he was 22, he was on his way back to the university from visiting his parents. A severe thunderstorm overtook him. It was dark. It was windy. It was torrents of rain. It was thunder booming all around, lightning in the sky. And then a lightning bolt struck nearby, threw him off his feet. And that's all a medieval man had to experience. Surely it was the wrath of God. In a flash, his fate passed before his eyes. He visioned himself at the judgment seat. At once he called out to St. Anne, the miner's saint. Help me, I will become a monk. And of course, he lived. And of course, he became a monk. Now, as a monk, starting out, his room was seven feet by ten. He had a table, a chair, and a straw bed. It wasn't heated. There was one window. Noise, conversation, and laughter were forbidden. Martin was taught to walk with his eyes down. 
He was told when and who to bow to. And even throw himself in the ground, on the ground in front of. He was giving lowly tasks to learn humility. But he was given two meals a day, except on the 100 fast days when he would get one meal. And prayer started at 2 a.m., seven times a day. Sometimes during this process, it was said that Martin Luther wanted, regretted his promise to become a monk. But it was a promise, a promise he made and a promise he would keep. As he studied, the powers to be realized that this guy has potential. They sent him off to study to be a priest. And then as he studied the Bible, he began to question the practices of the church, particularly indulgences. After years of soul searching, Luther finally came to the understanding that Jesus was merciful, kind, and forgiving. He understood that when the New Testament spoke of the power of God, it was not talking about the power God possesses himself, but the power he implants in us. And he came to the realization that we are justified, which means God's act of declaring us not guilty for our sins by faith in Jesus. For the next 17 years, he tried to reform the church at great peril to himself. He knew that people who tried before were called heretics and were burned at the stake. His life had been threatened. In fact, his friends took him away and put him in a castle for four years. And that's probably where he might have got the inspiration for the song title we heard earlier today, A Mighty Fortress. Well, he didn't stay there, and the Lutheran church was established. The new covenant was understood once more. Throughout these 2,000 years, we briefly talked about this morning. It shows that God knows our sinful nature, our stubbornness to do things our way, and our pride that refuses to acknowledge our sinful ways. We even heard it this morning to forgive our sinful ways. Could it be that God wanted to prove to us once and for all, beyond any shadow of a doubt, our sinful ways and that we can't save ourselves? Is that why he took so long to do things? Or is it that he was demonstrating his patience, his love, his mercy. Or was it a combination of both? But we have to remember, everything occurs in God's time, not ours. We can learn from the Christian faith in the Middle Ages, where they were completely dependent upon others for the word and they were easily led astray. We now have a Bible in our language that we can read or listen to, and we can directly know God's word. I encourage you to read your Bibles and fact check what you see and hear. Remember, the Holy Spirit will help you find the truth. And one final thought. Moses, Jeremiah, and Martin Luther were all called to God's service to do his work. All three expressed doubt about their abilities. The tasks were intimidating, but God would not ask them if he didn't provide the skills, the knowledge, and the help to complete the task. God calls each of us to do his work. 
probably not in the grand fashion he called Moses, Jeremiah, or Martin Luther, where he had a burning bush, the hand of God, or a bolt of lightning. But then again, he may not ask us to do such difficult tasks. His urging may be more of a gentleness, a little whisper, a gentle nudge. And I leave you with this. If you ever find yourself saying or thinking, why me? You want me to do what? You must be kidding. Remember the calling of Moses and Jeremiah and draw strength and confidence from their experience. Amen. Please join me in the next hymn, Christ has made the sure foundation. Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
God. Trusting in the transforming power of God's loving spirit, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Let us gather in prayer. God, our Father, you call us your children. As siblings in Christ, unite us in one body to heal the church's divisions and bring understanding and peace where there has been contention and strife. God of grace, hear our prayer. God, our creator, your hands have made the heights of the mountains, the depths of the sea, and the life that animates all creation. Bring relief to areas harmed by wildfires, floods, storms, and human carelessness. God of grace. God, our reformer, you make all things new. Free us from complacency. Open us to unexpected challenges and kindle zeal in us for the future. Let your justice and peace roll down like waters wherever, wherever there is strife, injustice, war, or religious conflict. God of grace. God, our champion, you are our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Jesus, draw near to all who suffer and be their rest and comfort. We pray especially for Marilyn Honor, Angela, Carol Bowder, Loretta Beers, Brenda Christensen, Jer Christensen, Eileen Coombe, Donna Dubik, Mary Fianza, Peggy Frace, Elaine Goho, Jackson Green, Angela Ham, John Ham. Andrea Harris, Andrea Harris, Diane Heckman, Diane. Kathleen Hinckley, Kathleen. Mark, Hauser, Mark Hauser, Paige Hughes, Paige Hughes. Don, Hunsinger, Don Hunsinger, Verna Kirshner, Verna Kirshner Paul, Nepper, Paul Nepper, Nancy Miser, Nancy Miser Donald, Miller, Donald Miller, Mary Petrish, Mary Petrish Ruth Sable, Tyler Schlecht, Tyler Schlecht, Dwight Schock, Dwight Schock Jean, Surface, Jean Surface, Carrie Simmons, Carrie Simmons Robert Stufflet, Lucinda Tuckett, Derry Unak, Chris Ware, Chris Ware Holly, Welker, Holly Welker, Mary Wood, Mary Wood Gary, Zayner. Gary Zayner. God of grace, Your hear Lord. our prayer. God, our Savior, you made yourself known in the lives of all who have died in the hope of your grace. We give thanks for the witness of reformers like Martin Luther and for all whose example has brought us closer to you. God of grace. Gracious God, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your unending love and amazing grace. In the blessed name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please rise for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.
now to join us in our last hymn, Jesus is Calling. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord's face shine on us with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon us with favor and give us peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.